Tell him to unmute his mic. Richard, can you unmute your mic? Unmute your mic. All righty, I've done it. There we go. All right, so this is Dr. Richard Candy from York, Maine, and um, hold on one second. <laughs> I want to go grab my coffee as I have it nearby. Uh -huh. This is uh, Richard's book. And if you are at all interested in the history of these machines, that's the book you need to get. So um, instead of a presentation, we decided just to have a conversation with Richard and find out, you know, what got you interested in sock machines? What sparked you to write this book? Well, Jim, it, it's uh, been a long time. I realized I first applied for a grant to work on knitting machines in 1998. So I've been doing this for a few years. Um, because I'm an academic, I taught at Boston University for years, I was always a little jealous of my colleagues in other departments because they got to go to foreign places and look up stuff. So as I got into looking at the history of the knitting industry, hosiery industry, um, which had, in New England at least, taken over many of the mills, the weaving mills, uh, throughout New England, especially in the Laconia area and elsewhere, um, I sort of began a study of the hosiery industry in the 19th century. Then I got a grant from the Passold Fund to come over to uh, Great Britain. And I went to Ruddington, um, the Framework Knitters Museum that uh, Matthew uh, works at. And the librarian there named uh, Jack Smurfett used to be the, uh, he was a curator at Ruddington, but he was the librarian for the knitting industry nearby. He had put me on to these Griswolds. Uh, he said, there's a whole bunch of these home knitting machines and not, but not, no one knew a lot about them. So that got me on the track. And as soon as I came home, I wrote an article on a little bit that I had found uh, for textile history, uh, the Passolds uh, journal. And from there, I got into some of the American knitting machines, especially here in uh, nearby New Hampshire, um, I started working on Jonas Aiken and the Aiken knitting machine, which is a flathead, um, interesting early machine, and probably one of the first to uh, specifically design itself for home use rather than industrial use. Um, doing this research, I found out um, while most people claim that big industrial machines <coughs> came out of these small home knitters, in fact, it was the other way around. Um, those who worked on home knitting machines <coughs> often made use of the newest technology out of the um, factory industrial knitting machines. So I realized I had to figure out who invented what, where were they, and how did those ideas um, translate from one place to the other. So over the last 20 years, I've worked on, um, I don't know, something like 18 or 20 articles. Um, and eventually I decided I could uh, basically because of John and Bonnie Smola uh, encouraging me with the Circular Sock Machine Society, um, I decided I could at least catalog all the kinds of machines that were uh, invented or improved here in the United States, uh, some of which were sent to Canada and England and elsewhere uh, for final development and use. And that's basically what I did. Um, there's an enormous amount of information, but it's tedious and you have to go places. 
Now, I, I like going places. So I spent a semester at the Smithsonian in um, Washington, D.C. And because they had uh, closed their storage units where all the patent models were for textiles, um, and they had to get them abated, um, most of that time I was spent in the National Archives at, at College Park. They have the original patents, and the original assignments of patents, which means you could tell who an inventor actually sold his inventions to or rented them to. They'd sell town by town, county by county, state by state. Um, and there was this whole other business in um, selling patented ideas and letting other people actually make the machine. So I ended up with a huge amount of information that combined with newspaper articles and histories and all the other kinds of stuff one normally uses, um, I began to get an outline at least of who the players were in the CSM and other small home knitting machines, including LAM, which of course was an enormous um, corporation um, and lasted the longest of any of them. So that's how it sort of began. Um, what else you want to know? Um, well, I, you know, in this circular world that we have, the story that always goes around is that the companies would send you a machine and yarn and then you would knit socks for them and they would pay you X amount per sock or per pair, but they would find something wrong with them and then shortchange you. Is that a true story? Um, is that accurate? Uh, yes and no. Um, that, that system, which was absolutely the, the normal system in Great Britain, where whether you were working on framework knitting or you were working on a CSM at home, um, that had a century long tradition of um, giving you the machine, paying you per item, per pair of socks or whatever. Um, it didn't work so well here. Um, most of the inventors, if they were American born, were interested in you buying the machine and setting up your own business and they weren't interested at all in buying back socks. But come World War I, um, Gerhardt, Otto Knitter, and a couple of others um, finally got into not only making the machine and selling it to you, but uh, giving you a knitter's contract for a few years and buy back your socks. Um, <laughs> the biggest problem with this, they got too many socks back. Um, now, the Gearhearts in Clearfield, Pennsylvania, um, honored their agreements and ended up going bankrupt, still owning two buildings worth filled with socks that they had bought. Uh, so that's one way of getting out of the business, is just over uh, taking over all the socks and never being able to get rid of them. And Buffalo, um, the Oscar Kuno, the uh, owner of Auto Netter, was a clever fellow. He had been doing selling these machines in England. He ran into a little trouble of over promotion there and escaped to Canada, where he started over again, getting Krillman to actually make the machines. But come World War I and the Spanish flu pandemic of that year, uh, he was very, um, had a difficult time getting his machines out of Krillman. So he contracted with Gearhart and eventually decided he had to do his own manufacturing. So from 1918 on, he had his own uh, production. He also advertised extremely heavily. Uh, he hired an advertising agency. Uh, he hired as his manager, an advertising guy. 
and big oil, and they bought full page ads in all those women's magazines. And it's just an amazing amount of, you can follow year by year by year, the scale of their advertising. And it too created, just like Gerhardt had, lots of people who wanted to send you back their socks. And in fact, they sold to Sears and Roebuck and other major outlets um, so they could handle 10,000 pair of socks at a time. But um, you can't let the socks get ahead of the machine, machine sales because the machine sales are what's really keeping you busy. So they, t they did occasionally <laughs> cheat people out of, you know, otherwise perfectly good socks. I also think many people sent in things that they thought were perfect, but frankly, from a store's point of view, had problems, they were really seconds. But instead of paying you for seconds, they just send them back and cut you off the list. That made people mad. And the only thing they could do, because they couldn't actually individually sue um, the companies, they called the post office department because all of the stuff had gone back and forth in the mails and the postmaster general um, called the attorney general and in 1925 um, auto knitter the three owners um, managers of the place were sued by the federal government uh, for uh, fraud and the Buffalo newspaper, big headline, three people indicted for $6 million fraud. Well, that was certainly an overstatement. And two months later, they actually went to the post office department in Washington, and there was testimony on both sides. One of the best part of this 800 and 47 pages of testimony is that all those women whose faces appear on their advertising uh, get all these advertisements with people <laughs> all across the country who knit and send them socks. Um, that's um, that many of those people came and testified to the post office department that yes, I really am a real person. Yes, I can earn $1,100 a year. Yes, I do this, I do that. Um, so from the government's point of view, they sort of gave up. They just said, well, we won't do anything now, but if we hear more complaints later on, we'll close you down. Well, they might just well close them down right then and there. Um, once people saw that there had been, you know, fraud and uh, overclaiming, they didn't do like the judge in London had done, said a certain amount of puffery is perfectly okay in advertising. Um, here we sort of protected the customer and by 1925 they were out of the business of buying back socks altogether. Um, the company was sold, they continued to make machines, but within two years, none of the six home knitting machine manufacturers in the United States was buying back socks. So it was, uh, it's true, uh, they were a little sharp on how many people they turned down, but in point of fact, they had so many, they, you know, wanted to slow it down a bit. Yeah, that's, the government really cool. did it. that's really cool. I mean, because you hear, you know, it's kind of like the game of telephone where the, the, the myth has gone and gone and gone and gone. Right. Um, and there's a lot of crossover with machines too, right? As far as badging and marketing. Um, like I oh, just, yeah. Uh, there I just, there uh, were lots of, um, well, Gerhardt made auto knitters for a while, as you know. Um, and, you know, they just, in the first case, they just painted <laughs> the words auto knitter across the front, um, but eventually got a label, a, a badge. But yeah, you can find lots of machines um, sharing the same manufacturer. Well, and mainly that's that's because there is nothing in the auto knitter 
or the Gerhardt that um, hadn't come out of a public domain. There is no patented element of that that was so special that you couldn't make a machine just like it uh, without infringing on anybody. So by the 1920s, anybody who wanted to could put together a machine of standard parts and call it whatever they wanted. Well, I have a, an Ainsley machine and it's, uh, you know, it's got right in the base stamped on it, um, auto knitter. And yeah. it's got an auto knitter handle, but it's got a big Ainsley badge. Yeah, the last chapter uh, in the book uh, talks about Ainsley. Ainsley essentially took over all the, the companies that were going bankrupt during the depression. So bought out all the auto knitter, bought all the Gearheart parts um, and several others and uh, continued it um, essentially copying the, using the old parts and then essentially copying when they ran out of dyes or uh, uh, casting material. So it was, it was um, sort of the, all of those companies coming together under one ownership in the 30s and 40s. So there seems to be, you know, there's very early machines from the 1860s up until the 1880s. And then it seems like there's a real heyday from maybe the 1890s to the 1930s. Is that accurate? Yeah, yeah. from the 1890s, 1920s, um, it was the heyday of, of uh, invention, partly because um, in the early days, say the 1860s, 70s, um, they were still controlling different basic techniques of what a machine could do. Um, so that um, one inventor in Ohio needed the patent rights to somebody else in Wisconsin, and you sort of had to consolidate um, patent ownership or control to uh, be able to use them. By the 1890s to 1900, basically all that stuff was out of patent. Then it was public domain and anybody could use it. And so that creates its own little boom of new inventions and new machine coming to market. And then the market sorts out which ones work well enough to keep going. So now we've got some people that are asking some questions. Amy's going to read off a question here to you. Okay, so we've got quite a few. Um, let's see. The very first question, Richard, actually, I'm going to say that to last because that'll you'll get a chuckle out of that. So I'm going to say that to last. Um, somebody said when we when he started talking, he mentioned the question of what came first, industrial or domestic machines. Can he elaborate on that a bit, please? Well, my answer is the industrial machines actually come first. Um, because, um, well, two things. In England, they already had a perfectly good hosiery system going, so they didn't need to create a in, uh, machine industry and in factories uh, in Nottingham or Leicestershire. But um, British mechanics were extremely detailed. I mean, if you wanted things down to the quarter inch or less, you know, go to England and you'll find a really good mechanic who could do it absolutely perfectly. That's, so they didn't really see any reason to get rid of humans actually knitting things uh, on framework knitting machines or even on Griswolds, but they tried to control their unpatented technology by refusing to let framework knitting machines be exported and forbidding anybody who worked on one from ever leaving the country. So in the 1820s and 30s, we got a few British uh, hosiers who actually came to the Boston area, Philadelphia area, and began bringing British technology uh, to the old fashioned system. I think when they got here in Ipswich, for example, uh, they were doing lace machines, they were doing uh, knitting, and 
a whole group of British uh, knitters who lived in that area for about five years, sharing it with local mechanics in that area. And when their companies went out of business, many of them moved to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And that's where it ran into my research into Portsmouth. Um, it had, next to Philadelphia, the largest hosiery industry in the United States in the 1830s and 40s. And one of the younger sons of one of these British stocking weavers named John Pepper, um, so he emigrated so young that he was sort of brought up in the American technology and worked in some of the <coughs> casting, uh, the foundries and machine shops in Portsmouth. But he had his father's knowledge, his family's knowledge of framework knitting. And by the 1830s, uh, there must have been a dozen or so uh, inventors in Portsmouth who were English born, but married British technology with American um, desire to create a factory position. And these inventions ended up all being bought up, uh, some in Philadelphia, but mostly Pepper's stuff was all sold to investors in a mill in, in Franklin, New Hampshire, which was one of the first totally industrial knitting factories um, where all of these Anglo-American inventions and techniques were brought to bear. And it was there that Jonas B. and Walter Aiken worked under John Pepper to sort of figure out how to make these machines. And um, eventually the Aiken spun themselves off um, and developed their own industrial machines, some of which I think um, was a matter of stealing certain ideas from um, uh, John Pepper. But it, it was this sort of combination of British technology and American um, will to invent and industrialize that finally made all of the old factories that went bankrupt in the 1850s throughout New England, because there was a huge depression, you had all these knitting mills, I mean, uh, weaving mills needing a whole new technology. And so the Aikens and others provided good modern machines to go in those disused factories, which you could buy up for a dime on the dollar. Um, and for about, well, right through the Civil War, you really um, had an extensive um, factory thing. So most of the actual inventions got put into industrial machines first, but the principles could be boiled down to any home machine you wanted. All right, next question. I'm, I'm just mostly doing yep. these in order, so I apologize if we're... Nope. Okay, so a person, uh, Linda Martin says, if a person was taken off the list for sending in socks, did they get to keep the machine? Yeah, because they'd already paid for it. Yeah, okay. Um, did, they, did they buy the machine or... Did yeah, they, they the bought the machine. And that was really the problem. They were selling the machines at a healthy profit at 30 or 50 bucks a piece. Uh, and most people, that was a big chunk of their income. So they wanted to send some back to make the machine cost less overall. Um, that's why the government got involved in the first place. Gotcha. Okay. Um, Jen asks, when were the first machines made and where? Some were made of wood or were some made of wood? Well, the framework knitting machines are, are wood and lead and other metals. Um, and they were invented in the 15th century. Um, so there's about 300 years of framework knitting machines before you start getting um, metal um, uh, knitters. There's a transition point in the 1820s and 30s um, where we have, so, we have a little bit of lack of information because uh, the U.S. Um, patent office burned down in 1836. And the first really good uh, home knitting machine that could also work in a factory uh, 
with a couple of inventors. Um, and they've just patented their machine and the patent office burns down. So they resubmit it. And so their patent under the new patent system is number 126 and a half, because it's really the old one re redone. Huh. Uh, that's a perfectly good example. They, there's two inventors. They decide to, one person's going to take the south and one's going to take the north or the uh, west, that is Ohio and places like that, um, where they could sell their patent rights. Um, that wasn't getting them too far. So one of the inventors or someone took one from New York to Manchester, England and took it to the leading uh, machinist there. Uh, uh, his name was Whitworth, a uh, major inventor in England. And he essentially turned this partially wooden machine into an all metal spectacular design, the only one of which is in the uh, um, museum in London. It's in the book. Um, oh, okay. Let's see, I have a question. Uh, when and where did the Laguerre come into being and how many different versions of that are there? Luckily, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> it, it came into being in Canada. Uh, my suspicion is Krillman may have, in fact, manufactured it. Uh, who invented it? I don't know, because I limited my work. It was enough to do American machines. So the, okay. my, the machines I cover are those that have American invention or are assigned to somebody in Canada. So I do follow those that... Sounds uh, like a sequel book. Well... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somebody should work on, on Canada, especially French Canada, on this, because they kept going. You know, they weren't affected by the lawsuits and all in the 20s. And so they were continuing to, to um, do the same old system of buyback socks through the 1950s and 60s. Wow. Um, can you talk about the vin vintage Tuttle, the history of the vintage Oh, Tuttle. I love Tuttle, yeah. Um, I like Tuttle because uh, his great success was taking his patent um, and selling it to the Lamb Corporation. Because Lamb provided this whole alternative type of knitting on the flatbed, the V-bed. Um, and from the very start was an entirely uh, large scale market uh, machine. Uh, you could buy a Lamb machine and set yourself up in business at home easily. They never got into the buying back socks or any of that stuff. But it was the major competition to a circular sock machine. Um, at some point, uh, Tuttle in the 18, I forget, 70s or so, um, sells his patent to Lamb. And because they really made fabulous uh, metal machinery, the Tuttles are probably the closest thing in terms of weight and scale to some of the English machines. Um, we tended to be lighter machines um, and cheaper to manufacture. Uh, Lamb was perfectly happy to make really nice heavy tuttles uh, that worked forever. And I think they're just some, one of the best machines around. Um, there's a couple of variations of the Tuttle in Canada as well. Uh, any estimate of how many machines are still in existence? How many <laughs> uh, um, discarded slash scrap? Right. Um, during the wars, especially World War II, I think a lot was scrapped. Um, so depending on which machine invention you're talking about, uh, for example, uh, Jonas Aiken initially made one that looked like a sewing machine. It was a head in a table with treadles and looked just like the sewing machines of the day. There's only one of them, and that's now in New Zealand or Australia, I forget which. Um, but it was here until 10 years ago. Um, so it depends. With Gerhardt's, Auto knitters, 
Tryons, Tuttles, um, any of those early 20th century machines, there are thousands of them. Um, so, I don't know, there must be maybe 50,000 machines still around of one size or another. Wow. Huh. Okay. I wonder how many are, are represented by this group we have online right now. <laughs> um, I think so. There are people like Melissa who have lots of them. Yeah. <laughs> Melissa wants to ask you a question when, when, when I get done. She asked if she could ask you directly. So you, you're going to get a question from her in a minute. Well, go ahead and ask it. Oh, well, Melissa, do you want to go ahead and ask your question right now? And then I've got some other questions. So go ahead, Melissa. Yeah, this isn't any kind of trick question. Hey, Richard. Um, Hi. I was hanging out at a spinning thing one time and um, Paul and Hazel were there and I'll send you their last names because I've forgotten it, but they're very, very well-known geologists. Mm -hmm. um, my father was surprised I was running with that crowd. Um, <laughs> but but ha Hazel was giving a demo or setting up or something and I was talking with Paul and he asked me because he's always polite about the knitters and the knitting, the actual companies, not the sales offices. Mm -hmm. And so I started yammering and we talked about Coles to Manchester and being in Leicester and Birmingham. And then I talked about New Cyrus, Ohio and um, Georgetown, Ontario and Rochester, New York. And Paul looked at me and he said, you know, you realize that's where the, you have the, the concentration of the iron. And I think the lime that's, and of course it's too expensive to move your raw materials. Right. And so I wonder if, if this is just a small thing, but that the location of the actual manufacturing where your foundries are and maybe your sales offices like Creelman seems to follow these um, veins of, of ore, iron ore that's being worked. Have it's you seen possible. I think, I think that's true for much larger uh, corporations making things of metal like railroad uh, cars or engines, uh, other kinds of big engines. The, the amount of metal needed to cast simple CSMs probably wasn't enough to absolutely require it to be near the um, place of manufacture. Um, so there were lots of manufacturers in Philadelphia, which fine, they had Pittsburgh nearby, so to speak. But um, I, I think it's really more likely that it was just the location where lots of different kinds of metal machines were being made, not just knitters. Um, so okay. I have here, we have more questions. Um, yeah. So Judy wants to know, you, you mentioned something about you were able to buy mill building, buy mills for a dime a dozen or something. Where did the weaving industry go so that all these mills were empty? Um, they went out of business. Yeah, okay. Um, basically, um, in the 18, late 1850s, 1857, there was a huge depression and um, many of the smaller corporations would go out of business. Um, and that's where you get, you know, very inexpensive mill buildings looking for a new occupant. Um, that never affected the giant uh, Lowell or Manchester or these very big corporations, but it did the small town ones. Okay, uh, two more questions. Um, Connie says, I have read that during the Civil War, there was quite a bit of smuggling going on of information on the knitting machines. Can you tell us about any of that? Yeah, um, I did a whole article on the Civil War for the Early American Industries Association because they had given me a nice grant. Um, it's true. Um, Aiken's earliest advertisement for his sit down and treadle your knitting machine or your home knitting machine hand crank CSM uh, went both to North and South because it was just before the Civil War. Um, basically, the market was if, if it was being sold in the South, well, you've got large plantations, you know, get your people, i.e., your enslaved workers, to just turn that cotton into um, stockings. Um, and up north, it was every, every woman should have a business of her own and make socks uh, and in a much normal way. 
after the Civil War, during the Civil War, those two uh, broke up. And it turns out that since it was only the only sort of easily found working machine in the market at the time, uh, a number of people from the South talked their way across the Mason-Dixon line and came up north to buy Aiken machines to, as contraband to take back to the South. And I document one or two in the, in the book. Um, and I don't know how much Aiken himself was, I don't think he was directly involved, but I'm not sure how much he knew what several of his machine sellers, like uh, uh, Miss Branson and a couple other people who are on that border in Ohio, Indiana, uh, just far enough across the border that they could be selling to their local market, but also sell machines to people who might just smuggle them back south. Huh. And they did. Oh, interesting. Um, let's see. Um, I think one more question. Uh, any plans for another book? Oh, there are lots of books that I could write. Um, <laughs> I have plenty of information on it, but uh, I just had a 78th birthday. I don't think I'm probably going to do another one. It takes about 25 years between books to me. <laughs> so anybody who wants to take up the cudgel, I have lots of things you could inherit or <laughs> we could dicker on. Uh, I have, you know, dozens of big advertising material from each of the companies. I kind of like this sign that they used to <laughs> send out to, especially for, um, those who didn't sell it back to the country company, you could set up your own home business, but they advertise the brand name. That really is kind of fun. Um, here, if nobody's ever seen one, you can see that. Here's your- A little higher, Richard. So people oh, sorry. Can... Yep. Yeah, there we go. It's basically, this is the contract you signed so that you, know, you could send your stuff back to the company. Um, this is for, the Stebber, our friend Stebber, who mm. like to keep their their machine prices cheap by giving it, making them in, in crummy metal. Yes, you got that right. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't last too much longer, but you can see the wide range of. Yeah, hold them up there. There, you go. there we go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There are all kinds of knitting machines. This from a um, mid 19th century uh, German publication. And of course, there's, there's always a wonderful story of uh, invention on the front page of um, Scientific American, um, which I had never quite figured out how that all happened until I realized the owner of Scientific American was a guy named Munn. Mr. Munn uh, would, would let you have the front page if you paid his guys to do a big cut, uh, wood cut, uh, and he'd use it on the front page and then you got the cut back that you could then use in your own advertising. All of this is completely spelled out uh, in the Aiken machine stuff because with the Aikens, they kept volume after volume after volume of their detailed records of who did what, who did they send it to, how could they do both uh, home knitting machines and factory machines. Um, and it's all because they're using the same woodcuts and Scientific American and other publications. I did, I did one whole article for a group that studies um, advertising because it was a way of looking at the whole system of how you could patent your machine, get your advertising, and then set up your own print works for, you know, continued manuals and that sort of thing. Um, 
And um, just so everybody knows, there have been some questions about where, you're, where uh, Richard's book can be purchased. And if you look in the chat on Zoom, uh, that information has been shared and just has been shared again about where, where to find that. Um, Richard, uh, are these images that you held up in your book? So if somebody has the book, they can look at the, the pictures you just held up? Many of them are, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. I probably have twice as many as are in the book, but they get repetitive, you know, each time they get several things. Um, I would ask, uh, if somebody wants to order the book, just send me an email, um, and then I know that I should look for it in PayPal, that it might, in fact, be paid. Uh, and if you just send the money to PayPal, I'll eventually get your address. Um, but it's easiest if you send me it directly so I can be prepared. So give us uh, your email. It's, it's, the email just came up in the chat. So people okay, rcandy at Maine, the state dot rr dot com it's two dot you don't have the book it's uh, are you going to have it available on cd too is that still available no i you know we went through the thousand or so that john Huff, Luffel Holtz and i put this whole thing together um with an editor who's a mutual friend of ours um, john's wildly responsible for the layout and design of the book and but we sold a thousand of those and I'm not ready to go reinvest <laughs> on the CD. Uh, I, I think the paper copy is the way to go because you can flip back and forth and find, it's not a cover to cover read, it's uh, look for what you're looking for. Yeah, um, I, I actually for. did for the first time in 20 years, go back and read it cover to cover, which <laughs> for this, yeah. but uh, yeah, uh, it's, it is usually because you're interested in one machine or another and you just have to, find that. Well, I, I look at my copy all the time. You know, there's something will come up and I'll look for it and try and find a story about it. And the information is generally there. Yeah. Well, Richard, thank you. So people, we're getting a lot of feedback and uh, people are, said, somebody said, I could sit and listen to uh, you all day, Richard. Thank you for your work. Thank you all for being interested. <laughs> <laughs> it's fascinating. That was great. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. So uh, since we were talking about history, um, we're going to give away uh, three more of these um, Knitting Your Brigades of World War I books. Um, so let me get to where I can tell the names here. Give me two seconds. Um, and is Matthew Hamilton online? Are you on here, Matthew? If you are, Richard would like to get a hold of you. <laughs> you just email me. Okay, there you go. Okay, let's see here. Um, Hang on. The, the print on these is so small, it's hard for me to see. Uh, I've got eyes like that, too. I know, I know. 